welcome back to my animal education series. Today we're here at Clyde Plains Reptilian with Tiffany to talk about this beautiful snake right here. So So this is a copperhead, correct? Yes. And there are a bunch of different regions and different areas where you can find specific copperheads that all have separate names. But she told us off camera these snakes were confiscations, so we don't know, so we're not gonna talk about a specific kind of copperhead. We're just gonna do generalized copperheads. So my first question is, where can you find these copperheads out in the wild? Most of North America and New Mexico, kind of a lot of places. And as I mentioned before, with different regions, there's probably tons of different kinds of these guys. Yeah, you'll probably find different patterns or several different subspecies, but generally you can tell a copperhead from other vectors. And with the pattern, we can talk on that because that's how a lot of these regional differences are told. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that there are saddles, right? Yeah, so you can see there's that nice orangey rusty color that goes along the back and then it's broken up by those kind of off-white tan colors. Those are what we consider the saddles. And then with some of the different regions I've seen before, some people call them hourglasses or Hershey Kisses. It just depends entirely where that snake is. But again, as we mentioned before, these are confiscations, so we don't know exactly which one this is. Uh, so we're not going to try to guess and get it wrong. But first off, I want to talk about the protocol for these animals and explain that it is safe and we're doing it right that we have this, this snake out. Yes. So if you want to uh, cover it, at least reptilians protocols for handling venomous snakes. Perfect. So with reptiland, we require uh, you to get certified. So I am a certified venom keeper. That means that I've gone through at least 15 hours of on-hand experience with a previously certified keeper. Generally, our seasoned keeper is a senior keeper. And then I have taken a written test to know that I know the information, that I know the protocols for working with them. And then I've done a practical test where I've actually shown off uh, my handling skills and we even go as far as two days. So, as a venom keeper, I cannot let anyone else that is not certified work with these animals. Which is why I'm not handling it. Mm -hmm. As much as I would like to, it's just it's not smart, and I'm not certified, so I don't really know what I'm doing. And that's why I'm staying on this side of the uh, table, I'm not interacting or being anywhere close to the snake. So we're trying to be as safe as possible here with an expert, and one who's definitely not an expert. <laughs> so, back out in the wild, what kind of regions will these snakes prefer? So in this area of central Pennsylvania, they really like the rocky crags. You find them especially if you're going out hunting. But if there's anywhere where they can hide, where they can find a nice basking spot, we find lots of people saying they find copperheads around the water. They find them in their wood piles. So they're not super picky about where they actually live. It's, but pretty much a very general species. Yes. If they can be there, they will be there. Pretty much. And what kind of animals will these snakes eat? Typically a lot of snakes are rodent eaters, so I imagine yeah. mice is probably part of their diet. Yeah, so actually it's kind of funny when they're young, they eat a lot of bugs, a lot of invertebrates. They're very small, so they'll focus on that. And as they grow older and as they get bigger, then they'll focus on small animals, mice, anything they can find like that. And how big do these snakes get? Because I, I assume this is probably an adult or close to it. Yeah, this is an adult, so this is about the average size. Sometimes you'll see them get a little bit bigger. He's probably around two and a half, almost three feet in length. They're not a very large viper. And that probably makes them food for a lot of bigger predators. Yes, if there's pretty much, if they're not hiding, they're very much ready that they could be a prey item. This hiding will be anywhere like in leaf litter, which this, uh, Kind of rustic brown would be perfect for oh, yeah. leaf litter. And those but, nice saddles break up that pattern in the leaves as well. I'm also noticing the discoloration on the tail. And I know a lot of baby copperheads kind of use it as a lure. Yeah. So can you uh, talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so especially when they're younger, and it's not just copperheads, cottonmouths do this a lot as well. Their tails are generally a little more green when they're little. So what they'll do is they'll actually sit there and wiggle their tail. We call it caudal luring. So they're luring with their tail. And they'll kind of use it almost like a worm or grass to lure in any small animals. And if it actually gets to the tail, they'll latch on and eat it all. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen a copperhead, at least this up close, and where like, I can see the entire body. Yeah. Typically when I go to zoos, they're always half hidden or mostly hidden. Yeah. But I never really fully re realized that they, the discoloration kind of stays there up until adulthood. Yeah, it might not be quite as green, and as he gets a little testy, he might actually wiggle that tail a, lot, a little bit as well. Um, but he's not really luring anymore. It's just a bit of that coloration that stays. Uh, maybe I've been just flicking as an adult, just kind of get 
uh, attention away from the head. Yeah, maybe a little bit. He's just a little, just a little ticked off. Because <laughs> sometimes predators will be trying to eat them, and if they distract them a little bit, they'll take their glance away for like a little, <laughs> little millisecond that takes them to strike. Yeah, but copperheads aren't very strikey. They mm -hmm. tend to be very calm snakes. They're more likely to actually freeze and not strike, as is other vipers. So they kind of just want to mind their own business. If you come across one, leave it alone. And you mentioned that this snake here is a viper, so what is, is the classification for a viper? So vipers are a specific snake that generally have this nice triangular shape to their head, but we also call them hinged fangs. Uh, so what they do is their fangs are actually so long that they fold them in their mouth when the mouth is shut. And then when they're striking, which all happens in about half a second, they open their mouth about 180 degrees, those fangs will unfold, they'll strike and pull back and allow the venom to actually be injected into its work. So they're some of the most efficient venomous snakes on the planet. I think this is the first time in the video that we've specifically mentioned venomous other than your certification list. Yeah. So, um, besides for food, is this venom good for defending itself as well? It's a very mild venom compared to other vipers. They're not actually that dangerous even to humans. So really they only actually give anti-venom if you have a reaction most of the time. To be safe, they might give you some, but sometimes anti-venom itself can be very dangerous. So they don't really like to use it to defend themselves because again, for a very large animal, it might not even cause a reaction. What they do like to do to kind of defend themselves is sometimes they give a warning or dry bite, because sometimes a bite is enough to warn something off. They might not necessarily use the venom. And for someone who doesn't really know, they can't tell the difference between, well, I guess really anyone, they can't tell the difference between a dry bite or an envenomated bite right away. No, and especially with the venom, there is probably a little bit. Again, with the venom being so mild, uh, you could have a very mild bite and not have a reaction. So again, just to be safe, it's always good to go to the doctor just in case, um, and then be monitored. And you mentioned the uh, tri triangulation of the head. So other than uh, that for a viper, how would you tell this snake is a venomous snake without knowing what the snake species is? Copperheads are nice because they have that very distinct color. That's why they're called copperheads. But there is also some confusion, uh, especially in central Pennsylvania. Uh, they kind of sometimes get confused for water snakes. They kind of have that similar pattern. The orange color is very, very distinctive, and that triangular head is also very distinctive. There's also kind of this old myth that only really works in Pennsylvania and you kind of have to get close to the snake, but if you see that its eyes are have the vertical pupils, yes. here in Pennsylvania, that's technically the only kind of venomous snake is they're nocturnal, so they have elliptical pupils instead of uh, the diurnal round pupils. Other places in the world, that never works. No. So the triangular head is the best thing to go for if you only have vipers, which most, if not all, of the venomous snakes in Pennsylvania and most of the United States are vipers. Um, the orange color works perfect. You can see it from a distance. As long as you're staying on paths and being careful of where you step, you're perfectly safe. And always a safe bet is if you don't know what the snake is, don't, <laughs> me don't mess with it. Don't touch it. Most snakes are more afraid of you than you are of it. Give it space. That's why I'm always, uh, I tell people, like, oh, what kind of snake is this? What should I do um, to take care of it? Like, well, if you don't know what it is, don't touch it. But when people are out walking in the woods, what are some good ways that they can do to avoid running into um, a venomous snake or really any snake in general? The most important thing is to stay on designated paths. So a lot of hiking trails, they'll have specific areas where you are allowed to step. Stay on those trails. Don't go into any high grass where you can't see where you're walking. If there is an area or a trail that isn't as clearly, say, marked, um, definitely have a walking stick with you and always check the ground before you take a step. Uh, there's things such as snake boots, which are always fairly useful if you routinely go out hiking where snakes might be a problem. And generally, watch where you're walking. Don't go anywhere where you can't see your feet. Don't go sticking your hands in anywhere you can't see. If you mind your own business, the snake is going to mind its business as well. Oh, I did uh, see one thing, but if you are walking with boots on, does every couple of steps like stomp on the ground a couple of times? Yeah. Because the snakes will feel the vibrations mm -hmm. from that and just kind of they understand something that's coming, they're not going to be scared by your arrival. Yeah, and they're not going to come out in front of you because they're going to realize there's a very large animal, possibly a predator nearby. That's probably one of the best advice I give to people who are afraid of snakes and they like to go out hiking. Just stomp on the ground a couple of times and they'll feel you coming so they're not scared by you 
and they'll most likely stay away from you. Because mm -hmm. they think they're going to go away. Because they know you're, you're way too big for food mm -hmm. and you're a potential threat. So yep. they're not going to bother. No. Now you mentioned that these snakes are vipers. And I know that there's a classification of pit vipers and that these guys are one of those. So I imagine they have pits based on the name. Mm -hmm. Do you mind pointing those out and uh, I can try since those? his head's a little small. But you can kind of see the little nostrils right at the end. And behind it, there's almost like a hole in his face. There's one on each side. Those are what we consider the pits. So in those pits are nerve endings that are really great at sensing heat. So this is a nocturnal animal. He does like to hunt at night. So what those pits allow him to do is sense the body heat of any small animals that run in front of him and allow him to strike with 100% accuracy in pitch black. And then also I want to touch on the sense of smell for these snakes because a lot of people just see that snakes have a fourth tongue and that's how they smell. But also, I want to uh, see if you can tell the viewers about the Jacobson's organ on the roof of their mouth. Yeah, so what they do when they stick out that tongue, you know, it's just not just like a quick sticking out their tongue. They'll stick out the forked tongue and they flick it a lot and then they'll pull it back into their mouth. And the more interested, the more harder they're trying to sense that smell, the longer they leave their tongue out. So they'll get all those, sense part those scent particles on their tongue and when they pull it back, that Jacobson's organ is on the roof of the mouth. And that actually senses all of those particles from the scent and they basically taste the air. It allows them to figure out what side the animal might be on and generally what kind of animal it might be. I always think that's really interesting. I've heard that half a million times because of various snakes and lizards. I think it's super interesting every time and then for those of you who didn't know, like now you know. But let's put this beautiful snake away and let's look at another snake that same species but completely different looking. And here we have a much different looking copperhead. Mm -hmm. And the same species. Yep. So I just, we brought this guy out because we want to show you guys how different these snakes can look, even though they're the same snake. Because this guy doesn't have the defined saddles across his back no. either. It's far less of that rusty color too, but it's darker in coloration. And again, if you don't know what the snake is, if you see it out in the wild, listen to what she said. If you see the orange, then you can know it's a copperhead. Or you can just stay away from it and then not have any problems. But also this tail is a lot darker than the, the other snake as well. Notice yes, that. he's also a little thicker in just his body shape. Uh, he's a little bit of a better eater. So again, that coloring doesn't necessarily stay the same as it grows older. And I don't know if it's uh, just this one snake, but he's a little bit more feisty than the other yes. one. He, <laughs> off camera, he was showing a little bit more attitude, but now that the camera's on, he's uh, being nice and calm for us. Mm -hmm. Which is what we want to see. Yes. Last thing we want is a route of uh, Copperhead trying to yeah. maneuver around all he of us. He hasn't been pulled in a while. We haven't been doing venomous shows quite as often, which we do use our Copperheads for. So he might just been like, a, I don't want to do this right now. He's a bit temperamental today. Yeah, there's always one. <laughs> yeah, it's like any animal and people. They're going to be temperamental at times. They have their days. But again, thank you so much for telling us about these Copperheads. Uh, I was telling her off camera, I think Copperheads probably at least top three of my favorite venomous snakes. Just. Uh, how their heads look and how beautiful uh, the colorations are, no matter what uh, region they're from or coloration that they have. I just think they're some of the coolest looking, most beautiful venomous snakes. Uh, but again, thank you so much for telling us about them. Thank you guys so much for watching this week's video. Don't forget to do a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and as always, I will see you next week.